Um, thanks for your patience, I appreciate this. So we'll be talking about ECMA 6 JavaScript, the good parts, I'm a big fan of Crockford. I actually wrote him, a little fun fact, I wrote him some fan mail last summer because he's got kind of got his email published on his website. So I wrote him some fan mail and he responded and we bounced a few emails back and forth and that like that really made me feel cool. So, you know, <laughs> he's nice and he's funny and we, you know, he told some jokes, but um, I'm a big fan of him. So um, this, there was a, a book JavaScript, The Good Parts, written by Douglas Crockford, which is pretty much the Bible. You've probably all read it. So this is, we're basically going to talk about what comes next. In that book, it was O'Reilly, and they had a butterfly on it. I, a lot of people don't get my joke, so here. Um, that's where the butterfly comes from. About me, I'm Jennifer Estrada. I am a web developer, more like a JavaScript architect these days. This is my daughter. I brought her along for the talk. Um, I am a senior consultant software developer with Avanade. That's an IT consulting firm. I'm out of Chicago. I'm the front end development capability lead for the Midwest software engineering team. What does that mean for you? My primary focus has been getting .NET people over the JavaScript stack because all of our web projects we sell these days are the JavaScript stack. So um, this is why I'm interested. I like speaking and talking and everything like that. In my spare time, I also sometimes, when I have spare time, when you have two kids, you just don't have it. But Sometimes I like to speak at boot camps and stuff, and, and, and I'm really happy to be here, so thank you. What are we going to talk about? ECMA 6 JavaScript. I always like to read the state of JavaScript survey. Raise your hand if you've looked at this. It's really good. I'll, I'll show you the URL. Keep it in mind for next year. It's kind of neat. It's really a lot of it centers around salaries. You can kind of look at where am I, where do I work, what do I make, what am I using, and what's the industry standard. So at the very least, if you'll, I'll show the URL in a slide or so. If you um, keep this handy, it's a good place to kind of at the end of the year gauge where you are. You can even answer. I answered it last year. It was super fun. We're going to talk about const, let, and var, and then my opinion on what's right. Everybody's got one, right? And um, arrows and default arguments, template strings, destructuring, spread and rest operator, a little bit on promises, and then async and await keywords. In my opinion, these are the core functions of ECMA 6 that will really bring your code up to beautiful, clean, modern standards. So most likely you're already using some of these, but hopefully you'll come away from this an expert in all of them. All right, what is ECMA 6 JavaScript? ECMAScript, ES, ECMA, I, it's kind of goofy. There's not a really good way to pronounce it. It's a trademarked scripting language spec. This came, I like this definition. This came from Wikipedia. That comes from ECMA International, and it gives some, when you have a standard, you get a little number for it, and here's what we've got. This was created to standardize JavaScript. ECMAScript is also, it's not just JavaScript, but 99% of all languages which use, which implements ECMAScript is JavaScript. There's also JScript, which was a really weird, I think that was kind of a peripheral to .NET, I don't remember, and Adobe ActionScript. I don't actually believe people still use this, but um, that does not mean the code does not exist, because just like you know, ASP pages and Visual Basic, just because it's not current doesn't mean you're not gonna find it at work. So if you ever bump into this, that means you're, you must be working on some super front end stuff. This um, action script technically is ECMAScript. ECMA International was started by Brandon Ike, and that probably has to do with the name there. There's probably some correlation between the names. And you know, Brandon Ike was the person who wrote JavaScript. There were a few people involved in it, but he was a key player. At the time, this was Netscape, which eventually morphed into my favorite company, and I wish I could work there, but I don't think that's ever going to happen, Mozilla, which is the people who published Firefox. I love Firefox. I don't know. It's kind of dorky, but I think it's fun. Um, I also like their, when I need to use data sheets, I like Mozilla.org. ECMAScript 6 is this here, I liked this definition. I like this definition. I took this from GitHub, so that's why I put it on here. Um, ECMAScript 6 is 
ECMAScript 2015, which is kind of weird, but um, that's just the number they're on. This is the latest official version of the standard. There's more bleeding edge features, but these are the official features that we're gonna focus on. Um, ES5 is a significant update to the language, and the first update to the language since ES5 was standardized way back in 2009. Think about what web projects you were working on in 2009, so um, it's, a, it's about a six year jump there in functionality, so this is kind of the next year up. Implementation of these features in major JavaScript engines is underway now. This basically means that even in good old IE, all of this functionality is supported in all modern browsers. Here's a survey that the state of JS.com, I think this is really interesting, and if nothing else to take away, um, keep this in mind for the end of the year. I think this is a really great way to gauge where are you as a, because the JavaScript world changes so frequently, this is a great way to gauge where are you as a developer? What are you working on? What are you making? Where do you live? What kinds of projects are you building? And where does that align to the industry? So this is a super fun thing that, they, I forget who publishes this, but it's kind of its own standalone thing. And the website's really nice too. So what do we know? They talked to 20,000 developers and we talked about topics ranging from front end frameworks to testing libraries and salary and everything in between. So a uh, quick shameless plug, 5% of JavaScript developers worldwide are women, yes. Um, the most, we're, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna change that, we're working on that, but um, that, that's, that's the number as it stands. The most popular JavaScript flavor, and this was my, when I was going through the survey, this was my motivation for putting this talk together is ECMAScript 6. 86% of all our JavaScript developers use it, and this is 13% more from the last time we talked about it on the survey in 2016. And curiously, this is important stuff, the average salary of an ECMAScript 6 developer is about that of TypeScript. I will say that a lot of these features, if not all, um, are available in TypeScript, and then it, it properly builds down, you know, the, we well know the relationship of JavaScript and TypeScript, but that this, is, this is interchangeable here. So ECMAScript to JavaScript, like a node person, is nearly identical to types, a TypeScript developer. Closure script developers are the folks that I found statistically make the most money. So I think next year when I come back, I'll be talking about that. The most liked feature is elegant programming style and patterns, but people also think it's buggy. And I don't agree with this, but again, I love JavaScript, so I, I think I'm a little biased. But check that survey out. Okay, jumping into the content, var, const, and let. So um, you're most likely using let and const nowadays. I think that's pretty much become the standard. But let's talk a little bit about why they're different and what are the different things that do. Remember that when we create a variable with keyword var, we define a function scoped variable. So this essentially, var is global. The let and const keywords, on the other hand, declare a variable inside of block scope. What does that mean inside of braces here or locally inside of a function? Remember that when you declare a function using the function keyword that creates its own isolated scope right there. But um, even if we're not inside of a function, inside of braces also this is block scope. And outside of it, like we have up here, is global scope. The value of variables declared with const cannot be reassigned. reassigned. And we'll talk about this more in a second. I think const is a little tricky here. It's a lot different than our favorite strongly typed languages. Um, Const basically just declares an immutable binding. I'll show some examples of that. You actually can change, if you've got an object, you can change its properties if it's a const, which is, I thought was really strange, but it's kind of fun to talk about. So, um, two examples. Outside in the global scope here, var x equals 10, right? We used var, so it's always 10 outside of here. Inside of my block, x, in here, um, we're giving a value two of x, so inside of my block, x is two. Outside of the block, it's back at 10. Same thing with here, outside of the block, globally, x is 10. 
um, inside, let's do a const this time, and const is also block scoped. So inside of my block, x is two, and outside it's back at 10. More on the const keyword. I thought when I started unpacking, this is something I learned when I was working on this presentation in January, I was surprised that objects declared with const are not immutable, only the values are. Const, const creates immutable bindings. So when you use the const keyword, you're declaring a contract that you're not going to change the binding. This is totally different than anything you've seen in C Sharp, for example, and anything strongly typed things operate differently, but const is just an immutable binding. Why does that matter? That comes into play when you're declaring objects. Const, this, therefore, const does not define a constant value. It's a ref, constant reference to a value. I, this was a nice definition. You can add properties to objects declared with const, but you cannot reassign values. The only difference between const and let is that const makes a contract that no rebindings will happen. And in a second, we'll look at some objects declared with const and you'll understand what I'm saying. Const variables, um, like our strongly typed language cousins, const variables, on the other hand, must be given a value when they are assigned. You cannot declare a const, va const variable and then not give it a value. You have to do that all at once. Okay. Remember, const does not define a constant value. It's just a constant reference to a value. So what's going on here? Use, I think we see this car example a lot. So let's create an object car and use the const keyword. And here we've got three properties, whatever, fiat, 500, white. Um, we could change this guy's color. We can also ch give it a property. Mrs. Johnson owns the fiat. But you cannot reassign a constant object. Let's say, um, jumping back into the code, we're gonna declare our var variable car, fiat, it's 500, white. Notice this would error out because here we're trying to reference a new object literal statement here. We're trying to, we've, when we declare a variable, we're defining it with an object literal statement up here and then we would get an error if we tried to bind this variable to a new object literal statement down here. But interestingly, like we saw over here, you can, it's perfectly legal to go into each property and assign it a new value. This is the big difference, in a nutshell, between strongly typed constants and constants in JavaScript. As it stands, but I hope that doesn't mean too much. So, before we move on to arrow functions, I promised my opinion. I every, um, I think the general thinking is in this. If you use any kind of linting in your code, the general thinking is to stick with const and let and preferably const, anytime you can stick with const, always do const, and then use let to keep the scope of your variables as small as possible. I tend to disagree with that. I think if you're willing to kind of put the brain power into using some global variables where appropriate, I think it simplifies your code. Because when I code, I like to favor less variables um, doing more. Than, than variables all over the place unnecessarily, but that's just my lowly opinion. You'll kind of, if you read into it, I'm sure you'll develop yours. All right, arrow functions. Now, um, raise your hand if you've used these, just so I know who I'm talking to. Okay, a lot of us have. Um, these are super neat. Once you get in the habit of using these, you'll never wanna go back. Arrow functions are an abbreviated syntax for anonymous function declaration using, this is called the fat arrow. It's an equal sign and then a greater than instead of the function keyword. Now, this fat arrow and the function keyword, they both declare functions, but they do not do the same thing. The big difference is functions declared with the function keyword when we use the function keyword, we're declaring a new isolated scope inside of that function. Where when we declare a function using a fat arrow here, we're inheriting the scope of the surrounding code. And that's a big difference. Um, you'll see when you're doing callbacks and whatnot, um, any sort of array operations 
where you want to map and add a function, that there's a big difference, and I think the arrow function simplifies things a lot, but you'll see why that's useful. But they both declare a function, but they do things, they're not the same thing. So remember this, this is our vanilla old function, times two, and we've got our parameters, and then we've got our block statement, we always have the return if we're gonna return a value, and then we're gonna call it um, an arrow function here can simplify all on one line here. We're declaring a variable and assigning it this anonymous function here. Well, it's, it's a named function after the statement, but we're declaring on the right side an anonymous function with parameter params, and then this arrow, if you've not seen this before, this reads as into. So the way you would read this in English, params into params times two. And then the fat arrow here, what this does is creates an anonymous function. It's just a function statement there. And again, we've given it a name, so it's now a named function. And just like above, we can evaluate times two on the input four, and we get the same result. So um, it's, it accomplishes the same thing, but the way it handles scope, and, and there's minutia around the return statement and whatnot, um, they're, they're not the same but I think you'll love them. Let's see some of them in action. Oh yeah, one more thing. I really love the way arrow functions handle parameters. These are all valid ways of passing parameters to your arrow function. This is the one you'll see most of the time. And I think when you're first getting used to working with them, this can throw you off a little bit, but um, just think of it as this, and then eventually you'll get used to reading it this way. So we can have multiple parameters, we can have one parameter, we can have no parameters, and that's fine. And if we've got at least one parameter, we don't have to have parentheses. What's not valid in this case is if we had no parameters and then we omitted the parentheses here. That would not compile. Okay, arrow functions. Like we said, arrow functions have implicit return values if the block statement is not used. So what does this mean? If you have all of your functionality on one line, just a function expression like here, we have an implicit return value where we do not have to use the return keyword. I think this really simplifies your code. It makes it really elegant and you could do some powerful things here. You can also use an arrow function to declare a function statement inside of a block like this. Um, we're gonna call this an expression, and this inside of a block is a statement. You can also use a fat arrow to declare a function statement, but notice that we have to have a return value in each case, that's the big difference. Quick sip of water. I'm addicted to LaCroix, that's all right. Arrow functions simplify scope. We talked a little bit about this a few seconds ago. In standard function expressions, our this keyword is bound to the context in which it's called. With arrow functions, our this keyword is lexically bound, so it's bound to the scope containing the code in which we're using it. It inherits the context from the code that contains it. Arrow functions do not rebind our this keyword when we're used inside of another function. And right here, um, the attribute I'm pointing to right here without using the magic word this, our attribute here of arrow functions, our property right here, this is the most powerful thing. Arrow functions do not rebind our this pointer when we're used inside of another function. We'll see an example on the next slide. Arrow functions inside of other functions inherit the value of this. So like I said, you have containing code and then inside of that's an arrow function code. We'll see that in a second. And you'll see this refers to the scope of the containing code. A Little bit of a catch. Recall that orphaned this pointers default to the window scope. So um, for debugging purposes, if you're ever debugging and then you see um, you're checking the value of a variable and then you see any sort of reference to the window scope, that means you've got your scope wrong and it's an orphan this point, I'm just, gotcha. Arrow functions reduce the need for dot bind, um, this equals that pointers, et cetera, as we'll see in a second here. So they're super powerful and they greatly simplify the way that we handle scope. 
Okay. A standard function expression would need help with our inner this. So we've got an array nums, and we're going to iterate for each. And here we're using the function keyword to declare a function object in here. Once we use the function keyword, remember that we've essentially declared a new scope. That's how ifies work. We use if, you, in JavaScript, you use ifies and the function keyword to declare isolated scopes and private values. And ifies are great things, and I would love to talk about them for an hour, but I'm not going to do that here. But remember that once we declare a function block with the function keyword, we're essentially creating an isolated scope inside of the block here. And our this keyword, in this case I'm showing, points to the scope inside of the block. And I just realized I'm missing a paren here. Sorry for the typo. So what we've got right now, going back to the same scope, okay, our function statement, and then we've got a dot bind. This is the old school way of doing it where we would have to bind our scope inside of here to what's outside in order to match up our this pointers, in order to make the scope pointer inside of here match the scope pointer outside and the lexically contained code, we have to bind it. This is the old school way of doing it because I'm using the function pointer. Down below, the lexically bound this pointer in an arrow function is going to inherit from its container. This is way simpler in my opinion. Notice we're using the fat arrow. The difference here is the fat arrow instead of the function keyword. So because we're declaring our function block here with the fat arrow and not the function keyword, our this pointer inherits from the containing scope. So you do not have to bind it. There's no this equals that, no, none of that. You don't have to rebind your scope pointer. And, um, and in a nutshell, here we have the most powerful feature of arrow functions. I think anytime you're doing arrays, callback handling, anything like that, you consider, take a look at your scope and consider refactoring to using fat arrows because it makes your code a lot cleaner and a lot easier to use. It doesn't, okay, the caveat opinions, right? Um, what you're losing out here is um, the private val the private variableness of a function contained with or a function declared with the function keyword, you're losing that out. Um, things tend to be less private, more public shared scope, so it's, it's kind of a paradigm shift, but um, consider this for arrays and callbacks. It's super elegant, I think you'll like it. Okay, default parameters. Okay, this was super neat. JavaScript now lets us specify a default parameter when we define our functions. So I've got the pointer on it right here. So we're declaring a multiply function. And when it's got two parameters in the function signature here, but we're giving a default value to the second one. So you could guess what happens. Anytime you want to call multiply, if you do not specify a value for B, that's okay. The code is going to pick up what you were trying to say. So um, the meat of our function, we're return a times e, da, da, da. So then when we call multiply, we're only giving it a value for a, and it knows what's going on. Even better than that, I, this is really neat. Let's declare a function. And remember, you could pass functions as arguments, because why? Functions are objects. We're giving it um, a parameter with a default value, and we're also giving it a parameter with a function as a default value. So at runtime, when we call this, we're just going to return the two. So when we call down here, we give it nothing. What happens? Call our function foo. We're going to go back to the default parameters because we did not specify. We're going to pass one. And then we're going to evaluate multiply on the value for one, which is num, which is one in this case. And then we go back up here. Note how the default value persists. So it's going to know exactly, we've given it nothing, and it's going to know exactly what we're talking about. We're going to get one, two. Um, default values are optional. As you see here, we can give it a value of six, and it's still going to know what to do with it. That's a great way to kind of simplify and clean things up. Which one? 
I believe so. I do believe so. Where you might have some trouble, I don't, if you've got like a Nazi linter or something, which most of us use, that's where you might end up with trouble. But I believe this is legal TypeScript. Well, I was wondering, with TypeScript, there's one way of telling TypeScript not a secret set of JavaScript. And then if you cannot call a function with less properties than are specified as a function string, it will, the compiler will take that. Oh, wow. So I, I don't know if this is compiler code or not. Hmm. Yeah, that, that would be, I would expect it to pick the defaults up, yeah. We do, um, I think what I tend to use is the Airbnb linter, and um, whether or not it compiles, that thing doesn't care, that won't. <laughs> the, the, a lot of stuff doesn't fly with that, which technically compiles, but that's kind of a, a, a run around answer for you, is it depends on your linter, but that, that's a really good point with the default. Thank you for that, and that was a good question, thank you. Um, it's just your linting process. There's a couple different options out there, and I like to use the Airbnb one, but it's very strict. That's all I'm saying. Obviously, after you lint, you're going to have to build. Okay. Template strings. Raise your hand if you're a React developer. No, I love React. I have such a crush on React. I think it's the coolest thing in the world. But um, I actually been, simply because of I need a job and I need to pay my bills, I do a, actually a lot of Angular because those are the contracts we tend to sell where I work. But if you are a React developer, I know you have seen template strings. And all this is is using backticks instead of apostrophes. From afar, it looks the same. It might have thrown you off when you first seen it. Use backticks instead of apostrophes to open and close your string. Template strings can span multiple lines. This is very important when you're working with a J, any kind of JSX um, to, to comprehend your HTML that you're writing. Template strings can span multiple lines, and what we've got is some interpolation brackets here. I know we've seen this with MVC Razor, we've seen this with Angular, and you see it in React. Um, I know you've seen interpolation. What that does is this tells the browser, as it's parsing your string, look in your JavaScript code and evaluate what's inside here. You can even use the interpolation binding to call functions. It's very neat. I've got an example in a second. OK. Um, just playing with template strings. We've seen this plain old hello world. We're going to log hello gen. We've got two variables, a equals 5, b equals 5. And then let's log out the statement, JavaScript was written in. And here we've got interpolation brackets. So the browser knows, don't print this, this is not a string. Our interpolation, our interpolation braces tell the browser what's inside of this function should be evaluated as JavaScript, and your browser will know, go to your memory stack in JavaScript, grab these two values, add them together, and then this is what we get out. I'm not actually sure that that's true where JavaScript was written in, in 10 days. It might be like a developer urban legend, but I know the story of JavaScript is that it was kind of a hurry up and get this done, but anyway. Um, here's, let's declare a function using our function keyword, so I need my return statement. If I just wanted to name this guy and use the fat arrow, it would be simpler. Yeah, yeah, we, um, let's, let's just use the old school function and notice I need the return statement. After we talked about fat arrows, this seems kind of redundant, doesn't it, the return? But anyway, we'll, we'll do it old school for now. This is taken from my son's favorite book. Um, I've got a string, and I purposely used double quotes to delineate my string here. Am I using, oh yeah. Um, start and end, this is just a string literal. So all we're doing inside of my function is returning a string literal, literal. So let's log out. And notice I did this to demonstrate, this is also another great way to use nested apostrophes. So you don't have to do with any escaping or anything like that. This is just another option, at the very least, if you want to deal with your strings. We've got a back tick, a string literal, and then I've got an apostrophe. And then inside of there, we're going to evaluate my function. 
So what logs out? A told B, B told C. Um, do you see, this is the important part, I've got my apostrophe here that still gets logged out and it's not considered part of the delineator. So um, at the very least, this is in addition to spanning multiple lines and using the template, this is another tool you have if you have to deal with strings and you don't want to deal with any sort of complicating, complicated escaping. Okay, I thought destructuring, I I think this is my favorite one. I know you're very concerned about what I love about it, but this is JavaScript. We all love it, get passionate. Destructuring, this is very useful. You can now use braces on the left side of an expression to extract data from arrays, objects, maps, sets, etc. To extract data from any sort of enumerated set, you could use braces on the left side. It's very useful, check out these examples. This is an essentially an inverted object declaration. This is one that was, I hadn't really used that much of this until about a year ago, and I, this is one I find quite useful and I use every day. So let's declare an object. An engineer is Jen Estrada and she lives in Chicago. Um, this is valid here. It kind of looks like we took our statement and flipped it. What we used to do back in, ECMAScript 5, this is the old school way of doing things where we declare two variables, first and last, and then we'll give it engineer.first, engineer.last, and explicitly bind our properties. That's the old way of doing things. But then if you look here on the right side, this is perfectly valid up here to create our, define our object inside of the two braces and then assign it to what we're destructuring on the right and then these first and last variables exist with values here. So this takes a little bit of getting used to, but I think this is very concise syntax for dealing with this sort of situation where we've got an object and we need to extract properties. Because if you're coding with JavaScript, you're using JSON objects and you're using, this is pretty much like 25% of all your code. So um, I really love this syntax. I think you'll find it cleaning up your code quite well. Destructuring object properties. Now things do get, destructuring works similar to a shallow copy, where literals are copied and objects are referenced. It's so basically it's not perfect. Um, nesting of object and properties in general will follow syntax, but it's not perfect. Anytime there's some ambiguity where the browser compiler, what it's not a compiler, where the browser interpreter cannot precisely figure out what you're talking about. Anytime there's an option for ambiguity, you're gonna get an error and you'll have to work with default values. But I'm, I omitted that here because we just wanna do overview. But in general, this here, the syntax notice, I've got name, first, last, and then go in here and I'm referencing my object by name and then I'm giving it first and last. And I just realized, I'm sorry, this is a syntax error with my slides, pardon me for that. But um, what we're doing in our destructuring statement is we're referencing the object name and then in another level of braces, we can go in and get each property by name and our first and last still exist down here when we log them out. We need to reference the object level in our destructuring statement basically. Okay, this is my favorite and this is my joke. <laughs> Based on, I, I, when I first saw this, I thought of the spread gun in Contra, so I don't know, in my head it was funny. So based on the ellipse operator, based on context, our ellipse operator is interpreted as either the spread operator or the rest parameter. This is very useful when you're dealing with lists of objects and arrays. The rest parameter contain, collects all remaining elements from a function parameter list into an array. The spread operator allows our iterables, arrays, objects, strings, maps, sets, et cetera, to be expanded into single elements. And let's see an example of that. So based on context, the ellipse operator does some very important things with arrays and lists of arguments. Rest parameter case A. The rest parameter collects all remaining arguments from a function's arguments object into an array. Now the arguments object is weird. 
It's not an array. It's an array-like object called args, which contains a list of all your key value pair name referenced arguments to your function. So it's not an array, it's an array-like list. But how many times have you taken in a list of arguments and you want to perform an array operation on them? Map, filter, reduce, etc. So you can't do any of these array things, but if we put the rest parameter, it collects everything in our list of values into an array, and then you can go in your code and manipulate it as if it were an array. It's very useful. It'll clean up the way you deal with arrays. Note, though, however, if you're inside of an arrow, this only works with a function declared using the old school syntax with the function keyword because arrow functions do not have an arguments object. So if you try to do something like this with an arrow function, you're, you're going to get goofy behavior. So don't do that. But let's look at some examples. Okay, um, let's create an add function using the function keyword. Here's our rest parameter. And again, it's the ellipse for both cases, but based on context, your browser knows that this is the rest parameter. It's gonna collect everything into an array called args. So here, our array operation is totally valid, and then you can clean up. You can omit the need for any sort of code that loops through your argument values and creates a set or does whatever. You, you can greatly simplify the way you're dealing with any sort of string of values here. All these guys, 1, 3, 15, et cetera, these are valid. Um, note that this guy only makes sense at the end. If we had something like this, where we had argument A and then a list of arguments and then argument B, this doesn't compile correctly. Just like with any JavaScript function, um, parameters are optional, that's true, but order matters. You can't only specify um, come on, the second and the third value in your list. You can't omit this guy. It would, the, the order is interpreted by the browser. So um, it's the same thing for the rest parameter. It only makes sense at the end. Or the beginning, if you've only got one, is in the case here. But, um, you can't really do it at the end. It doesn't make sense. Okay, spread operator. This guy allows, and I need to pick up the face. This guy allows iterables, arrays, objects, springs, to be expanded into single elements. Again, anytime you're working with an array, this spread operator is really going to simplify your code. So we've got, um, this, this is, the, and I, I'm making a joke about Contra. I hope you laugh. This is, I'm showing my age, that's all right. Constant, let's declare ARR as an array of three different types of guns, right? Um, we're gonna create a new array and we're gonna use the spread operator in front of our array here and then we're gonna add somebody else. So this is the result. I think dealing with arrays, this is a common situation. If you did not have your spread operator here and you tried to do this, you'd get something weird. You'd get an array with two objects in it and the first would be or an array with three values and then the second object in your array would be the last homing gun thing. And um, it, that's never what we want, well in most cases, that's not what we wanna do, but um, that's what you get. So I think this really cleans up the way you deal with array concatenation, array manipulation, et cetera. A uh, quick copy down here. Note that this is a shallow copy. So if you had some objects going on, um, it, it, it's just a shallow copy. You wanna be careful, right? But quick copy. And again, I think it's most useful here when you need to pass an array of values as separate arguments. Let's say we've declared our function to take three different argues, you could, and you've got an array, you could go down here and use the spread operator to break them apart into separate values and then you've got a perfectly valid call to your function. Okay, promises and the event loop, really quick. JavaScript code, as we know, runs single-threaded. Wait a minute, how is it single-threaded? Well, this is how the event loop works. Our browser runs a single execution thread down here in what's called our event loop. And this is our code executing. And, oh, I don't care about my iCloud storage, sorry. Okay. Um, sorry about that. 
So JavaScript runs a single execution thread down here in your browser. This is our event loop. Now it's going to respond to events like this. And if we want to do asynchronous functionality, our seriously, I'm sorry about this. I don't love Max. I'm sorry about this. OK, I don't care. They're trying to sell me something in the middle of my presentation. But that's how it is, you know. <laughs> Everybody's trying to sell you. And curiously, we actually at home did have Microsoft's virtual assistant, because my husband works for them. So um, Cortana, I think she's got a new name now. But Cortana is the only one that doesn't try to sell you something. Alexa tries to sell you something. I had the Google one for a while. It was trying to sell me something. Apple is trying to sell me things in the middle of my presentation. Um, I digress. Back to the JavaScript event loop. In our browser, the way that our single-threaded yet asynchronously capable JavaScript code works, we've got this event loop running in our browser, and this is running our code. Um, it responds to events. The way that we implement asynchronous functionality is through browser API methods. JavaScript code runs single-threaded in our event loop down here, but asynchronous function functionality is implemented using our browser stack here. Our code will call API methods, um, um, look for your HTTP response, et cetera, um, set timeout, blah, blah, blah. Those asynchronous methods are not part of the event loop, but they're actually calls to the browser API over here. And then we're going to call them, we're going to put them on the stack, and then the stack is going to wait for our HTTP response, our timeout to expire, et cetera. And then when this is done, it gets popped off the stack. And once the stack is done, we go back to our loop and we keep looping. So where am I going with this? ECMA 6 implemented the Promise API to elegantly interface with our call stack from the event loop code. So the Promise API is, some co is a library that we can use to elegantly handle this situation. And I'll show an example in a second. But before I do, most of you, are, raise your hand if you use Promises in your JavaScript code. A lot of, OK, yeah. So, so you've seen this before. But um, it's worth mentioning, this was a big thing of ECMA 6, that's all. And um, later on, we'll talk about async await. Those are, those are new features. Promises. Promises are a design pattern which greatly simplify asynchronous coding. They let us cleanly handle callbacks from asynchronous function calls. So we can cleanly handle the return, our HTTP response, our set timeout, et cetera, and any like web API things we might need to do. We can cleanly handle those callbacks using the Promise library. Promises are non-blocking. All that a promise is, and we'll see an example in a second, it's a container for a future value and a contract in the code that we will indeed receive the value. Hence the name promise. I think it's kind of a dorky name, but it really makes sense if you think about what it's going to do. Um, promises are exclusive, where other handlers cannot alter the value that we're going to get back. It's immutable. And we're also guaranteed to receive the value, regardless of whether we register a handler for it, even if, this is the big part, even if the value we get back is already resolved. So when you're working with asynchronous code, you're always going to be working with a resolution of some sort. This is on, think about this in contrast to events, where all your code is doing is, oh, responding, somebody clicked on me, whatnot. Um, events can have race conditions. They're all over the place. There's no contract. There's no guarantees. But promises, on the other hand, our code knows eventually we're going to get a value back. A promise is an object which is used as a placeholder for the eventual results of a deferred and possibly asynchronous computation. I thought this was a really great definition, so I thought I'd share it. Use the promise API. So how do we use it? We're going to declare our promises, and then we're going to specify what to do when we get a response back. And if we want to resolve our own promise, that's fine. That's part of the API. You'll see it in a second. You can chain operations. You'll hear people say the word venable. 
um, because you use the then property to declare what your code needs to do when it gets a response. So you'll hear these called thenable. Let's look at some examples. P is our new promise. Here we're using the promise API to declare our promise. We're passing it a function object with two parameters. We've got what to do, what function to call on resolve, and what function to call on reject. Inside of our declaration, this is where we're actually going to call the asynchronous API method here. And then we talked about um, resolve, reject, those guys contain what to do on the resolve, reject state. So here we go. Our, assign a function object to the then property, and our code will execute this when we get the resolve back. So we get our resolve back here. Um, then resolve into our function statement. This is completely, so when you're writing synchronous code and, you, and there might be a time where you need to deal with values inside of an asynchronous function, you can, you can explicitly resolve on your own. If, if, let's just say you want to have a scalar value and you want to make it compatible with your asynchronous you know, flow here. You, this is perfectly valid. This is a very short overview of asynchronous programming, but I just want to get your feet wet with promises in the event you might not have. Um, oh, I got a little bit more that I need to hurry up. Before I move on, does anybody have any questions about this? I know you've seen this, but okay, good. I'm glad everyone knows it. Okay, this is something I really liked. ECMA 6 gives us the async await keywords with which really simplify working with promises. You've, you've probably already seen this. If not, take a second look. I think it, it really cleans up what you've got going on with async await. Um, place the async keyword before a function to cause the function to return a promise. So what async does is it tells our browser our return value here is going to be a resolution compatible with type promise. Non-promise functionality then, let's just say we want to return a scalar, we're going to have to do that in a promise.resolve. So here we go, here's our async keyword. We're declaring our function f with the function keyword. Um, return one, this is, this is valid, all it does is return a value, but notice because we've declared this function with the async keyword, we can use, um, it's venable, they call it venable. We can use the dot then clause with, of the function to define what to do next. So anything declared with async is using the promise API. So what does that mean? It inherently has a then property. Um, just like right here, we can, because we're working with a scalar, we can also return promise.resolve. These are essentially the same thing. Asynchronous functions are thenable, meaning they return a promise resolution. So why would you want to do this? What's the point? This is basically just a shorthand for the um, syntax we just saw up here where you we're using the API to declare a promise. This guy is a shorthand for that syntax. I think it's elegant. I think it really cleans up your code. All right, await. Async and await. We're gonna use the await keyword inside of our async function. Now, the await keyword does not work with the base promise API. You need to use the async keyword in order to be able to use await. So if you want to block for some reason, for some reason you want to block your code, use the async keyword to pause your execution until a promise resolves. Why is this useful? Sometimes blocking is useful, but um, if you want to block before the await keyword, if you wanted to block, there wasn't a really great way to do it. So using one keyword here, as you'll see, in the middle of my lines because I've got to highlight. As you'll see down here, using one keyword, we're going to block until this promise resolves. So we're creating the prom we're inside of an async, we're creating a promise here, 
and then we're going to block until we resolve from it, sign the return value to result, and then, you know, print it out, do whatever we're going to do. But again, a wait is only valid inside of async functions. I think this is super useful anytime you need to deal with any sort of blocking, whatnot. But. time. And that's it. That's the best part, in my whole opinion, of ECMA 6 JavaScript. Any comments? So I, we've got like four minutes left here, but anything I can do for you at the end. Um, here's my LinkedIn. Feel free to tell me you loved it, you hate it, this, that, any, if you wanted some of the slides or anything like that, if that's useful. If there's anything I could do, feel free to connect. There's my LinkedIn. And um, thanks very much. This is the first time I spoke at NBC, so thanks for turning up for my talk. Thank you.